Well, good morning, Park Cities. How are you? My name is Han. I'm the worship pastor in the Great Hall, and today I'll have the honor and privilege of sharing God's word with you. Um, I, whenever I get a chance to be in the sanctuary, I'm always blessed and, and humbled, uh, as a matter of fact. I'm, I'm always, I've always admired worship here in the sanctuary. I've always thought that there was a sense of reverence and humility, uh, something that, that as a young minister that I hope to continue to learn uh, as, I, as I see the example here in the sanctuary. Um, also wanted to just thank you uh, to just on behalf of my wife and I uh, welcoming us here uh, in this place as uh, we share God's word. So before we begin, uh, won't you bow with me and pray. God, we thank you. We thank you for all that you have done for us. Lord, we gather here in this place of worship to acknowledge how amazing and how awesome you are. More specifically, Lord, today we want to acknowledge the love that you have for us and what that means. Sometimes our perspective of love is, is not where it ought to be. And so, Lord, I pray that you would correct our thoughts if it's not in the right place and that our hearts and minds will be focused on giving you thanks for the love that you provide, for the love that you give and show each and every day and each and every moment that we are alive. God, we are so grateful to be in this place be lifted up, and it's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. Well, how many of us have ever misunderstood God because of something traumatic that might have happened in your life? You know, in Forbes magazine, uh, there was an article about leaders who feel misunderstood. Ron Carucci is a consultant and contributor to the magazine, and he said this, and I thought this was very, very interesting. He said, our, our emotional response to any given situation stems from our past experiences. We catalog these moments, and they become subconsciously recorded as the stories or operative narratives that help us make sense of the world. Carucci was stating this as a common explanation of why people might misjudge leaders or a leader if that leader is ambiguous or, or just confusing about his intentions and vision. You know, when I think about a person or people who have ever misjudged or mischaracterized God because of their past experiences, frankly, I think of the Israelites. Throughout the Old Testament, I, I've seen stories of disobedience and have thought, how could they make the same mistake over and over and over again? Have you ever thought that, church? All the time, despite knowing God's faithfulness, despite seeing God's faithfulness head on. But perhaps I had misjudged the Israelites without thinking about their past experiences, which had undoubtedly shaped their worldview. In addition to not fully understanding a transcendent and infinite God during Moses' leadership tenure, the Israelites had a worldview that prevented them from seeing God for who he was during their time in the desert. Their worldview for many years prior to freedom was slavery and the fear that came with being subjected. Throughout this series, because it was in many ways the inspiration for this current series, we've been quoting A.W. Tozer, The Knowledge of the Holy, quite a bit. And I'd like to share a quote from, from there, if I can. And in it, he says this, Fear is the painful emotion that arises at the thought that we may be harmed or made to suffer. This fear persists while we are subject to the will of someone who does not desire our well-being. So in light of this, is it any wonder the Israelites responded to God the way they did? Especially when God revealed a father's love that would, by the way, include the wrath that comes as consequence to the sin that they had so often committed throughout their time in the desert. The Israelites and their worldview included subjugation and fear as they were subjected to hundreds of years of slavery in Egypt where wrath was one of the only things that they saw 
from the ones whom they were subjected to. Through this Beyond series, we learn that God is holy, he is sovereign, he is omniscient, omnipotent, and infinite. And while these transcendent qualities are meant to be admired and honored, there's still one quality that is not only transcendent, but beautifully imminent in a way that that sets God apart, far and away from anything or anyone else. And this quality is his love, which is our topic for today. Our central text today is coming from Exodus chapter 33. So if you have your Bibles, I wanna encourage you to open up your text to that chapter. And we're gonna be camping out here throughout our message today. And while you're turning there, I wanna just say simply that we'll see the nature of God's love through this passage. But more specifically, in light of the wrath that was shown in the prior chapter because of an idol that the Israelites made. You see, to those who do not know God, wrath is a strange part of who God is. And it is often misunderstood and certainly not associated with love. But here's the truth about God that I wanna share with you that will ultimately launch us into our points for today. And it's this simple truth, is that God is love and a God of judgment, which by the way, includes wrath. And wrath, just so we're clear, is defined in this way, God's holy reaction to sin. If God were love, but not judgment, his love would be unstable and unpredictable. If he were judgment but not love, his wrath would have overtaken us already. I feel that when people hear about God's wrath, particularly in the Old Testament, there may be a misunderstanding because they don't understand the holiness of God, which we talked about last week. But more specifically, they don't know what's on the other side of that wrath. We'll address the wrath of God in the end, but what I wanna share with you in our points is how God reveals his love on the other side of wrath. And he reveals his love in revealing two things. Essentially, we'll see through our passage in chapter 33 of Exodus. Essentially, we'll see two things. If you're taking notes, we have very, very simple points. His presence and his glory. He shows his love through his presence and his glory. So, so then firstly, God's love is seen through his presence. Before we talk about God's presence, though, uh, I want us to get some context before we dive into this. Uh, essentially, out of their lack of faith and impatience, the Israelites built a golden calf in Exodus chapter 32 as an idol. And so you can understand why God sent a plague as punishment for their sin in verse 35 Then because of their sin, God said this in verse three of Exodus 33. Look with me. God says, go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you lest I consume you on the way for you are a stiff-necked people. So the people mourned at this as it meant that the Israelites would just be on their own. But then enter Moses His intercession at the news of God's judgment is really where we see the importance of God's presence. I want you to notice that in God's judgment, he actually said that the Israelites would enter into the promised land, albeit the next generation would, but God still would bless them with what they wanted. The only difference would be that his presence would not go with them. I believe that Moses' intercession, it moved the heart of God. It moved his heart. Look with me, verse, verses 12 and 13. Moses says, uh, rather, um, you have said, you have said, I know you by name and you have also found favor in my sight, says God. Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. Did you, did you catch that church? Moses' desire 
right? In the midst of being judged as a nation, in the, in the midst of intercession, essentially expressed one desire, and that is to know God. While it is true that Moses was seeking affirmation from God, his desire was to know God more. That was his desire. Well, let's keep reading because you'll really see Moses' heart here. Watch this exchange between God and Moses, verses 14 through 16. God says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And Moses said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? You know, church, I I love what Moses said here because it reveals so much about Moses' desire And more importantly, what God values. Don't miss this. Moses' desire was not so much in the land that was flowing with milk and honey as it was in knowing that God would be with them. God's value was in his people, desperate for his presence over the promise of land and prosperity. So then if I may ask, church, what is it that you desire? Is it influence? Is it money? Is it power? Perhaps it's just comfort. If God promised you all of this and yet told you that his presence would not be with you, what would you say? What would you do? Church, we should know the heart of God. We should know that this is his desire. His desire for us is to seek his presence. He is moved by our desire for him. This is the cry of my heart, church, as I approach any assignment, as I've made every move, with every move and assignment that I've been given by the Lord, I approach this with fear and trembling. And, I, and when I'm confronted with my own limitations and weaknesses, I'm always confronted at the end with God's love for me as I plead for his presence as I plead for him to be with me no matter what. Many times I've prayed, God, do not send me to that place or to this assignment unless your presence is with me. I want your presence with me. I could end up in the most convenient and the most prosperous position and and, and place in my life, but if your presence is not there, then I don't want to be there. That has always been my prayer So church, may this be our ongoing prayer as we fulfill our calling to be the church. No matter what we're called to do, no matter what, no matter how much ministry success we experience, however you might define success in ministry, that God would go with us as a church, as a collective for us to say, God, I don't want to be a part of this unless your presence is with us. And that is, that is my desire for my personal life and I pray that this would be the desire of our church is to continually seek the presence of God no matter what. In addition to showing Moses' Moses' love through his presence, God revealed his love to Moses through his glory. So as if God's presence wasn't enough, Moses asked to see more. Look at verse 18. Moses boldly asked, please, Show me your glory. And then, and then God's response to Moses followed. In verse 19, God said to Moses, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Now, glory is a word, like many others in the Christian vernacular, that I believe is often thrown around without fully understanding what it means. Well, when Moses asked to see the glory of God, in the Hebrew, that word is is translated kabod, or the weight of God. Moses was asking to see the full weight of God. 
In other words, what Moses was asking for in verse 18 was meant to be overwhelming to the average human being. And so with that, God's response included a revealing of his goodness, grace, and mercy. You see, there is majesty and transcendence in God's presence and his glory. Thus, in the weight of what was to be revealed, it makes sense that God would do what he did in the way that he did it in verses 20 through 22. Look with me there. God said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand, take away my hand and you will and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So with this encounter with God, we see that the glory of God or the weight of God was revealed in order to bring transcendence to the imminent. Tozer explained this glory by explaining goodness, grace, and mercy, all components of this glory in this way. He says this, as mercy is God's goodness confronting human misery and guilt, so grace is his goodness directed toward human debt and demerit. It is by his grace that God imputes merit where none previously existed and declares no debt to be where one had been before. Tozer's words essentially reveal that the glory of God reveals the character of God. The glory of God essentially reveals the character of God, which in the imminent sense shows how much God is for us, how much God is for you. So glory, which was meant to be overwhelming to the average human being, was brought to the imminent for the purpose of giving life to us. Amen? Now, earlier in the message, I mentioned the Israelites and their worldview of slavery and bent towards fear. Well, this is not too different in my thought. This is not too different from those who are living under sin as it too enslaves the hearts of those who are not under a loving God. You know, God told Moses that he couldn't see his face and that there were limitations to how much he and others in this time could know God and experience God, which is why we see what we saw in verses 20 through 22. But John chapter one, verses 16 through 17 tells us this. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So church, we can know God through Jesus. God's willingness to show us his glory and his presence is a reflection of his love for us despite our sin. But how do we make sense of wrath or God's holy response to sin. And why is it so important to have wrath as a part of our theology or understanding of our infinite and ever complex God? Well, church, let's remember this. While God has been mischaracterized because of his wrath alone, it, it was actually precisely because of that wrath that we've been able to experience God's love. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23 tells us, and since we're all guilty of this, we deserve the wrath of God, but God's wrath is exactly what Jesus took on for you and me. 1 John chapter four, verses nine through 10 tells us this. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. Amen. Which leads me to my overarching idea that I want us to 
really think about as we close out our message today, which is this, Jesus, church, Jesus took wrath upon himself so that we could fully experience the love of God. Jesus took wrath upon himself so that we could fully experience the love of God. So because of this, we were able to experience the presence and the glory of God. So then all that we have learned throughout this series really comes down to this supremely transcendent attribute of love that when used as a lens to view what we can humanly comprehend of God's attributes become difficult to ignore and leave as truths that have nothing to do with us. For example, how can we ignore the holiness of God knowing that Jesus came to live a perfect life that we could never live because of the love that the Father has for us? Or how could we think that the sovereignty of God has nothing to do with us when in that sovereignty God works for the good of those who love him? All that God had claimed and proven to be is absolutely true. He is holy, he is sovereign, he is omnipotent, eternal, and infinite. And more specifically, the God who took wrath upon himself for you, this God loves you. Can you believe that? This God loves you. And how can we not respond to this? How can we ignore it? So then church, how do we respond? How do we respond to this? Well, as believers, if you're a believer in this room, you can be sure that God's presence will be with you. And sometimes we can forget and maybe perhaps even take for granted the fact that the Holy Spirit is with us. But like Moses, perhaps some of you need to commit to seeing God's glory. We're seeing him face to face. So for us, the glory of God can be seen through the reading of scripture a commitment to prayer and worship and fasting as we did this past Monday. Maybe for you, it's it's a commitment to go further in your faith by agreeing or by committing to baptism, proclaiming your faith in the assembly, proclaiming your faith to Jesus Christ and your allegiance to him. Or if you're not a believer, in this room and and you need to commit to Christ. Perhaps your response is a commitment to the one who took on wrath for your sake so that you can have a love relationship with God. Well, how did Jesus take on wrath for us? Romans chapter five, verses six through 10 tells us this. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Amen, amen. If you're not a believer today, I pray that your response today is to follow Jesus, to commit your life to him. However you are led at this moment to respond to his love, know that we have people who are willing to help you take those steps. If you're watching online, I wanna encourage you to leave a comment. Let us know how we can pray for you. Let us know that you have questions about the faith that we would, we would be happy to come alongside you and answer those questions. Well, church, as we prepare to go out, I wanna take a moment to pray. I'll I'll close this in prayer, but before that, if we can just take a moment to pause, to think of ways in which we can respond to God's love. However God is leading you, uh, I pray that you be faithful in responding to him. But let's take a few moments to think through uh, what God has been saying to us 
and then I'll close us in prayer. God, we are grateful for this love that you have for us. We thank you that, Lord, that you continue to reveal yourself to us through the word. And today we saw a side of you that, um, that Lord, frankly, we're, we're very, very grateful for. You took on wrath. Jesus, you took on wrath for us that we might experience love to its fullest. Thank you. Thank you for that. As we go from this place, may we continue to respond. We believe, God, that you desire for us to respond in love and in faith, and may we do that, Lord, for we know that you delight, you delight in your people chasing after you. We are so grateful, Lord, that this is the kind of God that you are. And so, Lord, continue to remind us of the importance of the fact that, Lord, you desire for us to pursue after you. You delight in that. And so we wanna continue to show you love, Lord, We're so grateful for this time. We love you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray.